with guests Rakshanda Jalil, Harsh Manda, Pavan K. Varma, Abhinav Chandra Chud, and Mihir Sharma. Rakshanda Jalil is a translator, writer, and literary historian. Her latest book is But You, Do, you Don't Look Like a Muslim, a collection of 40 essays on religion, culture, literature, and identity. Arshmanda is a human rights and peace worker, writer, columnist, researcher, and teacher who works with survivors of mass violence, hunger, homeless persons, and street children. His books include Looking Away, Inequality, Prejudice, and Indifference in New India. Pavan K. Varma is an award-winning writer, diplomat, who is now in politics. He is the author of over a dozen best-selling books, including the iconic Being Indian and Becoming Indian. Abhinav Chandra Chud is a, an advocate who practices at the Bombay High Court. He writes a column for Bloomberg Quint and is the author of books such as Republic of Rhetoric, Free Speech, and The Constitution of India. These authors will be appearing in conversation with Mihir Sharma, senior fellow and head of the Economy and Growth Program at the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi. He is the author of Restart, The Last Chance for the Indian Economy. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, presented by Rajasthan Patrika, the Leadership Series, Rakshanda Jalil, Harsh Mander, Pavan K. Varma, Abhinav Chandra Chud, and Mihir Sharma. Hello, I'm Mihir, and uh, thank you for all coming out this uh, lovely afternoon uh, to listen to us talk about something that I fear might be slightly depressing. Um, we're on the eve of our 71st Republic, 70 days, uh, 70 years since the first Republic Day, and it's a sort of interesting moment, let's say, in our life as a Republic. Um, there are people who are concerned about the direction of this country. There are perhaps a large number of people who are very happy about the direction this country is going in. But what is definitely um, a fact is that there are large numbers of people on the street, you know, holding up pictures of the drafter of the Constitution um, and reading out the Constitution's preamble and so on and so forth. So this is a very, you know, unusual moment in our life as a nation and as a republic. And we're here to talk about, um, I mean, the title of the session is The, Un the Unraveling. Um, but I think we're going to question, um, do we appear particularly divided at this moment? I mean, there is, a, there is a context to all this. Has something changed in the recent past? Were the changes from earlier on in our history as an independent country or even before that? Um, is there a long process of unraveling of our institutions, of our composite culture that is coming to a head now? Or are we sort of unfair to blame this particular moment or to take this particular moment and declare it is different from ones that have gone before? And what is being lost is something being gained, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I want to start by asking you, Pavan. Um, could you just tell us something about this moment as you see it? Not the, the pol politics of it, but as, you know, you've spent a lot of time in government, you've, you're, you're a writer who's talked about being Indian. Um, how, has the, how have institutions and identity changed in the past 10 or 15 years? Well, I think, Mayor, for the sake of brevity, I want to focus on three things. And they are bipartisan. They affect you and they affect me. They are part of the evolving fabric of India. 
And the first of these, and I'll touch upon them in greater detail as we go along. The first of these is, I think somewhere the near demise, the death of idealism. This country has seen peaks of idealism in the past, where people have uh, sacrificed for a cause irrespective of the proximity of the political dividend or reward. And have done so willingly, have faced the consequences, but have stood by what they think to be right. And for many of us, the freedom movement seems too far remote, and yet the freedom movement is still that touch point which provides us the moral compass, the ideological way that in this country we have seen peaks of refinement, peaks of idealism, which still need to guide us because politics, unfortunately, in our country is becoming exceptionally cynical, transactional, and based on short-term political gain. The second is, there seems to be a collective amnesia in this country to the fact that we are not only a young nation, but a great civilization with very seminal messages to us. For instance, in the context of the debate now that is current on the question of respect for all faiths or of intolerance or whatever name you wish to give it. I am a scholar of Hindu philosophy. My last book was on Adi Shankaracharya, apart from others. I believe there's a central message coming to us which is being unraveled. And that central message came from the Upanishads. Ekam Satya Bipraha Bahuda Vadanti. The truth is one, the wise people call it by different names. Ano Bhadraha Kritavo Yantu Vishvita. Let noble thoughts come to me from all directions. Udara Charitanam Vasudheva Kutumbukam. For the big hearted, the entire world is your family. That's my tradition. Our civilization was dialogic. The three foundational texts of Hinduism, here I'll take 30 seconds more. The three foundational texts of Hinduism are the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Brahm Sutra. And it's very interesting because we must be in touch with it, otherwise there will be an unraveling. The Upanishads are a dialogue between the Guru and the disciple. The Bhagavad Gita is a dialogue between Lord Krishna and Arjun. And the Brahm Sutra, interesting, interestingly enough, before the author puts down his inference or conclusion, he puts down the opponent's point of view first, takes it on board. This whole thing about sabya samvad, civilized discourse, respect for the other, the ability to synthesize disagreements, not to dismiss that which is not in consonance with your views as either anti-national or befitting you to go to Pakistan or labeling you as a Pakistani agent or calling you a peddler of fake news. This is not what my civilizational legacy is. I may disagree with you, but I respect you for the fact that you have the right to be holding views which are different to me. And the last point quickly and there I will stop because many more people will talk about it. There is an unraveling to the sensitivity of society to the degree of marginalization, poverty and denial of rights in this country. Paropkar, the whole notion of Paropkar seems to be dying because we seem to forget that we still have the largest number of the abjectly poor in this country, in the world. We have the largest number of malnutrition children in the world. We have the largest number of people who still can't read and write in the world. And they live cheek by jowl with us, but we don't seem to notice this deprivation. This is an unraveling for my culture, for my civilization, for my nation, and for my republic. So, Abhinav, uh, Pavan just talked about two things. He mentioned the idealism 
um, that is essential to politics, which perhaps we saw a lot of in the freedom movement. And he also mentioned the sort of civilizational message um, that we may be losing track of. Now, um, you've just written a book on how Indian secularism as a you know, characteristic of this state and this republic evolved. Um, and he, you know, you've traced it through British colonial times to the early years of independence and, uh, and in particular the Constituent Assembly debates and two recent court judgments. Is there a sense in which maybe we are overstating the unraveling happening now and that there has been a movement and a moment in which, um, uh, you know, throughout our history as an independent country, this has been in process? So, you know, that's a great question. Today, the movement seems to be, and the argument seems to be, that the Citizenship Amendment Act violates the secular structure of the Indian Constitution. And I do think, and I've written a paper about this, I do think that the Citizenship Amendment Act is discriminatory. That having been said, for those who argue that the Citizenship Amendment Act violates the secular fabric of the Indian Constitution, I say to them, we have to read the Indian Constitution. You have to read the debates that went into the enactment of the Indian Constitution. You see, saying that something is unconstitutional has this emotive value. It's unconstitutional. How can it prevail? But our Constitution has, in various parts, a very dark history. You see, Articles 6 and 7 of the Indian Constitution were enacted in the backdrop of the partition of the country. Once India was partitioned, two waves of migration took place. In the first wave of migration after partition, after March 1947, a large number of Hindus and Sikhs came to India. In the second wave, which occurred in 1948, a large number of Muslims who had left India for Pakistan, for West Pakistan, came back to India. The law treated these two categories of people differently. If you were a Hindu or a Sikh, you were referred to by the law as a displaced person. If you were a Muslim who had left India and gone, then you were called an evacuee. Because your property, evacuee property, was meant to, to rehabilitate displaced persons, in other words, Hindus and Sikhs. Now, when Muslims started coming back to India, this created a problem for the likes of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru and Sardar Vallabhai Patel, whose secular credentials are absolutely unquestionable. And they, in fact, wrote letters to each other and said, look, the arrival of the Muslim in India again is creating problems. Because in this charged environment, there's going to be communal rioting. This is going to feed the communal poison that, that nourishes the RSS, as Vallabhai Patel wrote. So what do we do about the return of Muslims to India? And it was at that stage that our constitution essentially brought about, and I'm talking now, of course, just before the constitution. In, on 19th July 1948, a system was introduced called the permit system. Under this system, a Muslim who had left India and gone to Pakistan, to West Pakistan, could not come back to India unless the provincial government where his property was located consented and said, yes, please allow him to come back because that property is not being used to rehabilitate refugees. Now, this permit system was not introduced for East Pakistan. And that is because while there were not that many Hindus left in West Pakistan, there were still 16 million Hindus in East Pakistan who were still coming into India because they were being forced to convert to Islam or to leave. So if a permit system had been introduced for East Pakistan, it would have prevented Hindus from coming from East Pakistan to India. The Constitution of India essentially entrenched this system. As Dr. B. R. Ambedkar explained in the Constituent Assembly, for those who come to India before 19 July 1948, he did not say who. The Constitution does not say who. But Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru said that this is presumed to be Hindus and Sikhs. For those who come before 19 July 1948, citizenship is automatic. But for those who come after 19 July 1948, you need a permit. You need to be registered as a citizen. So there was this inherent discrimination in India, in our constitution, between evacuees 
which is really a euphemism for Muslims, and displaced persons, a euphemism for Hindus and Sikhs. So to those who argue that the Citizenship Amendment Act violates the secular fabric of the Indian Constitution, I say that we have to go back into our history and understand that there is a dark part to the Indian Constitution. That having been said, and I'm, I don't want to, I'm mindful of the fact that I'm taking up time of others. I do believe that the Citizenship Amendment Act violates the Indian Constitution because the conditions which existed at the time of India's partition no longer exist today. At that time, there was, of course, a great influx of refugees. There was a charged communal environment that doesn't exist today. The Citizenship Amendment Act doesn't only discriminate against Muslims. It has left out Jews. It has left out Baha'is. It has left out people who believe that there is no God, atheists. An atheist can be prosecuted in Pakistan. There's death penalty for blasphemy. But the Citizenship Amendment Act does not give refuge to atheists, to agnostics. Under the Citizenship Amendment Act, a Parsi who is fleeing religious persecution from Afghanistan can become a citizen in five years. But a Parsi who is fleeing religious persecution in Iran has to wait 11 years. That makes no sense, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about this. But the mere fact that the history of the Indian Constitution is dark, some portions of it, does not mean that we have to keep reliving that history. And I do believe the Citizenship Amendment Act is unconstitutional. Rakshanda, um, I think that if I were to take off from what Abhinav is saying here, he's saying that certain things are written down, right? Maybe certain institutions are created, but it is um, the cultural context and a shared culture sometimes that gives life to these institutions and to what, has, what is written down. And I think for many years we could have claimed that in our country our institutions were given life by the fact that we had or believed we had a composite culture, a shared sense of what you know, it could be meant. Let us suppose that that culture is dying, if not dead. What happens now? I, I will come to that in a bit. I'll come to the idea of culture. I'll come to the idea of Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb, which has become a dirty word almost now. But allow me to uh, draw your attention to what I see as a defining moment when this unraveling that we're talking about happens, to my mind. And it happens in fairly recent times. September 1990, to October 1990, L.K. Adwani decides to go on a Rath Yatra from Somnath to Ayodhya. Now, I was born in 63, so people of my generation grew up in a India that still had vestiges of a Nehruvian uh, secularism, socialism, what have you. Uh, growing up, I did not feel uh, the oppressive weight of the partition. Nobody from my family went, and I didn't know people who... Uh, so it was not such a big thing. I remember growing up in an India where you could happily toddle along in very many ways. Um, friends and family invoked a glorious tradition of living together separately, which meant, okay, don't give your daughters in marriage to the other, you're very particular about dietary restrictions, fine, don't eat in so-and-so's home. But the ill will, the bigotry, the prejudice, the hatred that flowered dramatically in the 90s was not there in my growing up years. And I can tell you this, I lived in Delhi, and I do not, there was, would be the occasional uh, prejudice remark, but in a country as plural, as diverse, as multicultural, multi this, that, the other, of course, we make fun of people on the basis of how they look, what they dress, their skin color. So being an Indian Muslim was also one of those things. It was not so sharp, it was not so normalized. What I see emerging from the Yathra are things that we see in, in a very normalized, crystallized fashion today. Take the idea of the Rath Yatra itself. I know I'm not coming to your question of culture, but allow me to digress a little. Even the idea of a Yathra is a Gandhian concept. We've had sessions earlier. I believe you were in the session. No, who was? So we've had earlier today sessions on Gandhi and so on. 
Now, Gandhi is the one who is going on a Padyatra, he is going to salt Satyagraha. So the idea of appropriation also starts. Very many things come. Very many things come from this Rathyatra. The idea of co-opting people, of, of a mass movement, such as the one we have not seen uh, since independence. So even though it lasts a month, September to October 1990, there are very many things that the seeds of discord, the seeds of polarization, the seeds of mobilizing people, of course, in the 40 years till this point, a lot of legwork has happened. Uh, a whole f army of foot soldiers are doing this work. But it is from 1990 that we see um, bigotry becoming the new normal, right? Before that, the Nehruvian India that we talk about, and let me now come to your idea of, of culture. G what is Nehru doing in contrast? Nehru is saying, let the temples of modern India be the schools and the colleges and the dams and the factories. He's setting up the Sahitya Academy, people in his cabinet are setting up the ICCR and the ICSSR, the Indian Council for Social Science Research, the Indian Council of Cultural Relations. No one better equipped to talk about culture really than you, Pavan, you headed the ICCR. Now, what is happening now to these cultural bodies? There is a systematic seeding, there is a systematic appropriation and all this is not happening suddenly in 2014 or suddenly in 2019. There is a process. And to my mind, the unraveling that we are talking about is not happening in the partition. The partition was uh, a brutal severance. Three countries came out of that severance. Two first and then subsequently three. But it seems to me that the, 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 the normalization of prejudice it did not happen. There was a knee-jerk reaction. Of course, there was communal violence, both before 47 and the years later. But we had a good 20, 30 odd years where we were all putting our shoulder to the wheel and as a nation saying, let's get on with the business of nation building. And that nation building, culture was just as important a part of that nation building. The cultural bodies that were set up, we are so quick to poo-poo the government. But all of these bodies came with very healthy mandates. The Sahitya Academy had a very wonderful mandate. All of these government bodies that were set up in the years immediately after, uh, uh, after 47 were meant to be uh, safety nets, were meant to watch out for interests of not one or two people. So this majoritarianism that we see today, to my mind, this is coming from 90. This is, of course, there is 92, there is Ayodhya, there's Gujarat, but all of that seems to me to be, unra to be unspooling from that one moment. I'm going to come to Harsh in a minute, but I want to take you up on this for a moment, Rakshanda. Wouldn't have, I mean, to, to my ears, what you're saying is, we created these bodies to, to uh, preserve and promote this notion of cultural, uh, uh, you know, of a composite culture that we had in the Nehruvian years. And then out of nowhere, you had a political entrepreneur who came and, you know, began this unraveling. The way that I might argue this is to say, that means that those 40 years we failed. 40 years we did? Those 40 years, those bodies failed. Culture began to be associated with the Nehruvian state in a way that maybe it should not have been. So then somebody comes in from the outside and says, that is not our culture, that is what the government is telling us. Our culture is different. Our culture is the Rathyatra. I don't think the bodies per se failed. I think a dominant discourse was allowed to flourish, was not allowed, but actually fomented and encouraged to flourish. And what we are seeing is the flowering of that dominant majoritarian discourse. Now, we have examples in the rest of the world where cookie cutter nations are coming out. You know, you have a cookie dough, you have a cookie cutter that has identical people ideas coming out. What these bodies were doing in the realm of culture was to encourage diversity. And I think they were doing a fairly good job. I, I would encourage Pavan to come in here and talk about culture. Pavan, would you like to want, want to do that? I think I'll come back to you, Pavan. I just want to get um, Harsh to talk about something before we come, I, because I think a lot of this is about, about cultural stuff, so we need to come back to it. But Harsh, 
in this current moment, and I know you'd want to talk about how, how it's different now, but I want to sort of shape your discussion of this with one question, which is, we've heard, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, discussions of the Rathyatra, we've heard Abhinav talk about the constitutional moment. Um, a lot of those moments were like the Rathyatra moment, maybe with people not talking to people who disagreed. I don't think Advani was seeking to change anybody's mind about what they uh, already thought. He was trying to develop, you know, maybe give voice to something that was subterranean. How do we speak in this moment to people who disagree with us? Um, no, about this moment itself, and I think addressing what you're saying and what has come before. See, I grew up, I was born um, about seven years after India got her freedom. I remember a childhood when I cannot recall in my home, in my school, in my boarding school, in, you know, in what I watched in cinema, in our discussions, hearing bigotry. Uh, I never recall uh, the flaunting of one's wealth. Uh, you know, uh, there was inequality, but you never flaunted it. We were brought up to be broadly uh, thrifty, kind, uh, and, and tolerant. Uh, my grandson is one and a half years old, and I, the moment he makes sense of this world, he's going to hear bigotry all around him. He's going to hear it in his home, he's going to hear it in his school, he's going to hear it in social media. There's a certain normalization of hatred and bigotry that we need to acknowledge. There's something else also which uh, Pavan very rightly, you know, what troubles me most about New India, uh, my book is called, one of my books is called Looking Away. And I think that, that it is this capacity to see and look away uh, at you know, we see a homeless child every single day of our lives living in a city. Uh, and uh, she'll be sleeping under the open sky and uh, never see the inside of a school, will be get raped at night. And I, I don't care and I come home and I put my own daughter to bed and give her. I think it, it is this indifference to inequality and suffering. Uh, a, 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 this idea of just, just thinking about ourselves. Um, I feel that this period is going to be regarded when the history of these times is written as one of the most cruel periods in human history. Uh, because we have so much, the resources many times over to ensure that no child should sleep hungry, uh, that no child should sleep under the open sky, no one should be. And the increase in the wealth of the top 1%, just the increase in their wealth was, was more than India's entire union budget. There, there, there's something about this moment and, and in that, the, uh, the unwillingness to listen to disagreeing viewpoints, of course, has changed the civility of public discourse itself uh, from the time of Nehru to, to now, where any disagreement is seen as against, you know, not just against the supreme leader, the government, all of them are the same, the Hindu religion uh, and uh, the country. And, and, and if you disagree with one, then therefore you're against the, the religion and uh, the dominant uh, and, and the country itself. But I just wanted to say that, that in all of this, the last few years, I was feeling that India was slipping further and further into this, this place of, uh, of, of the acceptance of inequality, but also the normalization of hatred and prejudice. Uh, most of all, in the journeys that I've done in the Karwane Mohabbat, about 33 journeys to places where people have been lynched across the country over the last three years, and the kind of hatred, people, you know, families where we decided we'd visit every family that has been lynched, and they'd reached a point when people used to say, I wish we, they, just, they just should have just shot him. I wish they just knifed him. You know, why did they kill him with so much cruelty? Why did they gouge out his eyes? Why did they smash his genitals? This is the kind of hatred that we were seeing. And I was seeing also the silence of most of us. And it, it, is, it was so eerily similar to Nazi Germany, where, we, where they watched over many years what happened to the Jews and, and people remained silent. And I think that, that it was... What we are seeing over the last one month is going to be remembered as one of the most important moments in, in, in the journey of this republic, 
pulling back on all this unraveling that we all have spoken about. Because this is a moment where the specifics of what uh, you, you said may be right about what was, there are dark parts in our constitution. But there was a certain value, a set of values, uh, a, a, a constitutional morality about justice, about equality, about a country that belongs equally to people of every faith. Uh, that, that was being completely unraveled. And ordinary, uh, ordinary Indians saw this and came onto the streets with a spontaneity that we've seen across the country. I've now been, uh, you know, in really uh, from protest to protest around the country, lakhs of people coming out, Hindus and Muslims together. Uh, this is actually since Mahatma Gandhi's last fast. Uh, I do not think there's been a moment where people have come out in support of the idea of Hindu-Muslim unity, of people standing together. I, I can come out on the streets when I feel I am discriminated against. Here, people are coming out when they're saying, I will not allow my brothers and sisters to be discriminated against. And we are standing in this together. And I think it is, this never happened in Nazi Germany, never once. And I think that this is, this is a moment where I think we have pulled back uh, whatever happens tomorrow, even if these protests are crushed, they stop, we have won in a couple of ways in the pulling back of, of the unraveling of the Indian Republic. We have shown that we can, we care, and we stand together. And this idea, I mean, what was the appearance that there was a hegemony of the idea that hatred uh, and division was, was normal, that has cracked, and we have shown that, you know, you know they talk about completing the unfinished business of partition, meaning they want all the Muslims, remaining Muslims to go back, uh, go to Pakistan uh, or Bangladesh, and the remaining Hindus from there to come back. I say we are completing the unfinished business of the freedom struggle, which was a very different battle. That was a battle that India would be a humane, inclusive country. Uh, it would be a country where it would not matter which god you worship or if you worship no god. You would be in every respect an equal human being, an equal citizen. And I think that the ordinary people of India, young people, working class people, and most of all, working class women have come onto the streets and they understand. You know, the posters are saying, you divide, we multiply. Two words, two words, I saw one poster, two words that break my heart, colon except Muslim. This is something that they're saying, we will not allow you to do this to my brothers and sisters. And I think that we need to be proud of this moment. We need to hold on to the moment. India will push back on the normalization of hatred. And I think over time, I hope we will also address inequality and suffering of people from want. Thank you, Harsh. Um, now, my job on, on any panel that I am is to be um, the cynical person. So I'm going to say that's wonderful, and there are a lot of people out on the streets. But we live in a democracy, which means you have, you need to win votes. And we live in a republic, which means that there are various different institutions that are supposed to, you know, in between uh, elections, protect you. So I'm going to turn now to you, Abhinav. One of these institutions is the judiciary. And many among us, and I include most of us here, people who you know, talk in English, think that we live in a particular kind of society, many of us have believed that the judiciary is what is going to protect us. But perhaps it isn't. What do you think? So I think it's pretty unfair to say that just because the Supreme Court isn't giving you an immediate decision on the spot, the day on which the case comes to court, the Supreme Court is going to close the matter, that because the Supreme Court isn't giving swift justice on the first day itself, that the Supreme Court is somehow failing the people. I think that's not necessarily fair. Our system works slowly. There are tens of thousands of cases pending before the court. So obviously, and, and not merely that, the requirement of natural justice is that every side has to be heard, no matter how unjust a person might appear to be, that person has the right to file a reply in court and to be heard in court. So when a case comes up before the court challenging an important provision of law, be it the abrogation of Article 370, 
be it the Citizenship Amendment Act, you can't really expect a court on the very first day to say that, okay, we're going to stay legislation. By the way, to stay any legislation which is the will of parliament is extremely difficult, no matter how unjust or discriminatory a law is. Because it is a law enacted by the parliamentary body, there has to be a certain due process of law. Now, that having been said, I do think that there are a few things about our system that we need to start thinking about. You see, for any judiciary to function in an independent manner, it has to have what we lawyers would call security of tenure. In other words, if you're a judge of a court, you should have the freedom to decide a case however you want to decide it. And you should have the freedom and the, and the comfort of knowing that the government will not be able to penalize you for deciding a case a certain way, either by diminishing your salary, by transferring you to another court from a one high court to another high court, or by not giving you a plum posting after you retire. Now you see, the retirement age of the Supreme Court judge is 65 years. This age was fixed in the 1930s, at the time when the Government of India Act of 1935 was being debated. At that time, the life expectancy of the average Indian adult male was 26 years. If you look at the history of our country and the initial years of the Supreme Court, you will realize that many of the judges of the Supreme Court did not live to the age of 65. Chief Justice Harilal Kanya, who was the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of India, who came from the Bombay High Court originally, he died in harness while he was the Chief Justice of India. So you see, back then, 65 was considered to be life tenure. It was considered to be a very good age because many people didn't live up to that age. Today, 60 is the new 50. When a judge retires at the age of 65, he stays two decades, perhaps more, of life without judgeship. What does one do after one retires? So is it not possible for any human being, no matter how fair and just that person may be, to start worrying at the age of 63 and 64, what am I going to do, what's going to become of me? So this is something that we need to start thinking about. How do we ensure security of tenure for judges of the Supreme Court and for all the judges of, of our courts? Let me only say this. Going back to the topic of Citizenship Amendment Act, which court or which tribunal is going to enforce the mechanism under the Citizenship Amendment Act? It is the Foreigners' Tribunal. What worries me a great deal is that judges of Foreigners' Tribunals, by the way, they're not even called judges, they're called members. Members of these tribunals don't have security of tenure at all. So while High Court judges retire at 62, Supreme Court judges retire at 65, the members of judicial of the foreigners tribunals don't hold office until a retirement age. They're appointed for short terms that can be renewed. So you can be appointed for a one-year contractual term subject to, re to renewal if the government thinks that you've done a good job. So if you're a judge or a member of one of these foreigners tribunals, won't you start worrying that if I start holding that many Muslims are in fact Indian citizens, that the government will penalize me and not renew my term in office? So these are things that we need to start thinking about and worrying about. I think uh, we're going to open it up to questions in a moment. But before we do, uh, Pavan, the other way in which I think democracies function is through political parties. We may not like the ones we have, but they are the ones we have. Now, what is the way in which, in your opinion, moments like this, which are spontaneous and apolitical in many ways, as Hirsch pointed out, how can they impact the political process? If, they are, if you choose to be apolitical, and if the presence of a politician poisons the pure nature of, a, of, of an anti-CAA rally, I mean, there is nothing democratic about it then. No, I think that there's a big mistake we sometimes make to believe that all protestants, protesters are miscreants and all protests are anarchy. That is not the case. 
Article 19 of the Constitution gives you the right of freedom to dissent, to peacefully protest. If there are occasions of violence, that is condemnable. No one has the right to vandalize public or private property. But at the same time, people have the right to voice their opinion. And as somebody in politics now, the one argument I cannot understand is that while I may not like your protest, I cannot say you have, don't have the right to protest. You have the right. You cannot say that because an act has been passed by parliament, people have lost their right to express their dissatisfaction against a law passed in parliament in, and to protest democratically. For instance, I'll give you an example, and we have a legal luminary with us. Even the emergency was imposed legally by invoking a provision of the constitution and by getting a presidential endorsement. Now, because it's a legally passed act, did people or did not people protest against it? And ultimately, it had to be lifted. What is important politically, and that should not be a part of unraveling, is that in any country which is a democracy, there should be scope not only for protest, but for dialogue. If the government says, that you can continue to protest and however much you protest, I will not change. There is a breakdown of the democratic process. And that is something we must all try to be conscious about. Right. I'm going to um, uh, uh, throw the question open to the floor. But first, since this is a Raj Rajasthan Patrika leadership series uh, uh, panel, um, the Patrika runs a online contest. And the contest of our, for, the, for an audience question, the contest winner is Palki Sharma. And Palki Sharma has this question, which um, I think um, uh, is directed to Pavan, but I think anyone can take it. Um, if Pavan doesn't want to take it, then, you know, Harsh or Rakshan or Abhinav can. Um, I definitely won't. Uh, how democratic are media institutions in today's times? I think not as democratic as they should be. Asha, this is not a good enough answer. We'll move you see, on. <laughs> you I see, expected invective at this point. No, I'll <laughs> tell you, I, in my earlier avatar, I've been a diplomat. <laughs> so I try to say the same thing with greater emphasis by saying it in an understated form. <laughs> They're not as free or as democratic as they should be. And certainly there, are, there is a new trend, and I'm not saying it was absent in the past. We should not see things only in black and white. But there is a new trend even on important mainstream channels, which are watched by millions of people, which seem to carry a brief for the government, which is not wrong. But if on your panel and on your show, there are people who disagree with that brief. You must, must give them time to express that. That is important. If you are shouted down upon, and I've had enough experience on television on this, then obviously something is wrong, Meher. So I think that media, to answer this question, I think there is a crisis as far as the media is concerned and ultimately, it will have to be people in media who will have to take a stand against their own employers or corporate channels in terms of greater freedom of expression available to one and all. Does anybody else want to take, uh, take off on that question? Otherwise, I can. Well, well I think that... Um, I don't want to come to the media's defense here, um, but I do, you know, earn my living by writing for the media. And the fact is that you will get the media you pay for. And I would say probably 95% of the audience li listening to this does not pay for the media, so you get something worthless. If you start paying for the media, 
you'll get something of value. All right? So start paying. Right. Next. Um, questions from the floor, please. Um, I can't see uh, the back. Um, okay, anybody under 30? Because we are all over 30. Um, only people under 30, okay. Gent in the white, over there. Hello, uh, thank you for this wonderful panel. This question is not directed to anyone particularly, but can be taken by whoever could answer this. So I find there's a delinking between the political vote that goes on in, in like a EV, on the EVM machine and how people think after that. If you look at the time gap between the CA, anti-CA protests and the Modi government coming to power, there's barely a year or less than that that's happened. So why is there this missing connection between how people vote and how they react to what the same government does later on? Harsh, do you want to take that? And then I think I may have something to say. Here you go. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I just wanted to say a couple of things. One was that uh, we do have a first-past-the-post system. And uh, e even this time, 39% of the vote was in favor of the government. 61% was not. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that 61% needs a voice at, at, at a particular point of time. Uh, whatever the political system, I did want to say that there are moments such as what we are seeing today, where uh, whatever your defense of the, of, 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 the, of the Supreme Court itself, I don't think, firstly, this, the, the matter about how we are going to deal with this question of whether we will remain a country where everybody has equal rights regardless of their religious identity, whether we remain a humane and inclusive country, is something that in the end is not going to be decided sadly by our political parties because the entire political opposition has not shown the moral and political courage to take a stand uh, uh, in the way that we saw during the freedom struggle. It's not going to be resolved by the judiciary. I don't agree. I feel that, that over the last uh, several months, we have less and less faith in the way uh, the judiciary has stood in defense. Because for a majority to not turn majoritarian, the Supreme Court has a very special role in defending the rights of minor minorities. I don't see it playing that role. It is going to be decided by we, the people of India, on the streets. But I think most of all, it is, it will be, and it should be decided, not even, not in parliament, not in, in, in the, by the judiciary, by, on the streets, but most of all, in our hearts. I think that is where this battle is really being fought. Are we, are we going, going to allow the hatred that is being fostered around us to colonize our hearts, or are we going to say no? And I think young people are saying no to their parents' generation and to the climate in which they're being raised and saying, no, we do not want. And it is, it is really for the people of India to defend the constitution that we the people gave to ourselves. Okay. I don't think it is, it is political and it is not going to be resolved by formal political I, I, I think I want to move on, though I also disagree with that. I think that it's important to recognize that you can have a substantial minority on the streets and that does not reflect a democratic plurality. But both these things can be true. It does not take away from the protests or their importance. But you can have won a landslide victory and equivalently there be people upset about then what you do. All right, and I think both these things can happen coexist and they should coexist in a functioning democracy. Um, all right, now I would like uh, the lady in the third row, please. Hi, my question is to Abhinav. Abhinav, you say that, you know, mm -hmm. judges who are, you know, well-educated, and you are somewhere, I think, you're trying to justify that it's okay for them to ask for a job after the age of 65, which I think is pretty, pretty uh, this thing, you know? I mean, 65, they're retiring, they're, they have, they're well-educated, they take an oath on, you know, uh, upholding the constitution and you're saying that it's okay for them to ask for a plum posting after retirement? Is that okay? Is, are you justifying the corruption? No, I'm glad you asked this question because that's actually not what I said. I'm not saying the judges should in fact get jobs after 65 because that undermines their independence. Because if you're holding an office and you're reaching the, the age of retirement, 
And if, you're, if it's possible that the government might appoint you as the governor of a state, or if it's possible that the government might appoint you to another position, then will you not start, will that not undermine your independence? So I'm not at all saying that you need to get a job after the age of 65. But that's not the oath you take, right? When you become a judge, that's not the oath you take. How can you... And 65 is a fair age. What about the young judges? What about you if you want to become a judge tomorrow? Um, if, I may, if I may sort of respond on behalf of Abhinav here. Um, any institutions that are designed around people keeping their oaths are institutions that are going to fail. You design an institution for the least for the least trusted people in it, not for the most trusted people. The most trusted people will do what they want to do, will do what is right. You design an institution in such a way that even people who might not do what is right will sti still do what is right. So that is very cynical, actually. That it's is exactly a, my job sad, on this panel. It's a sad, sad day if that were That to has be been true. history throughout the world. The reason you design institutions... No, 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 no. Uh, being, being devil's advocate is all very well, but uh, don't take it so far. No, th th there is a moral frame. I, 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 there is a moral frame. There is a moral frame that we need to adhere to and we need to demand that our institutions live Why up to them. We call a spade a spade. The government often, and I'm not talking of one government, the government often seizes, seeks to manipulate the judiciary by holding out plumb posts for judges about to retire. That's the truth of it. And that applies to bureaucrats as well. And I believe that is wrong. And there must be the conscience among judges and bureaucrats at all if they have any conscience left anyway to resist that. No, and, and let the burden of the conscience not rest with the judiciary. Uh, what about us? Why are we the silent majority? We are all responsible, we are all guilty. So when is that sense of ownership going to come back to us? How many of us is, it's not a question of the protest, it's not a, how many sit-ins you sit in. And there, I mean, I hate to say this, but I actually agree with what you were saying. The number of people on the street does not translate into electoral gains this way or that way. It's not that, but how many of us are speaking up within families? How many of us are taking up cudgels against bigotry within our family? A grand aunt who is deeply prejudiced, do we, do we not sort of you know, take up issues right. with them. And that is the battle of the heart. That is the battle, battle of, of the heart. And that okay. is where this Somebody battle has to be won. further in the back, please. Um, can I have the lady in the, what looks like an ACAT jacket, yeah, be, uh, in the middle. In the middle, right in front. Third row, stand up, please. Yeah. Wait, what jacket did you I can't, I, I don't know. You can see the fabric. <laughs> My God. Hi. Um, you were speaking about uh, cultural institutions. Um, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I think uh, someone spoke about uh, cultural institutions and uh, their importance. Um, I would love to hear more about like how we can, um, you know, institute like conversations and diversity. We know that the Nehruvian model failed, but what about the future? How can we make it happen? It did fail. It was replaced by very many forces. Let's not go into those forces. Uh, I don't think it failed. I think it did very well for us. We have a neighbor who didn't have a Nehru, and look where they are. And we had a Nehru, and Nehru put us in a trajectory of nation building. Nehru put us in a trajectory of self-sufficiency. And the socialism that was inserted in our constitution did us no harm, I think. So I don't quite think that Nehru failed or the Nehruvian model failed. For various reasons, the world was changing and many things were happening. To come back to culture, uh, I was earlier talking on a panel on translation. In a, in a country as diverse, as rich as ours, let culture be a soft tool. Let it build bridges. We can't sit on these tapus, on these islands and talk to ourselves, hum baut achhe we are the best. No, we've got to build bridges. And languages, literatures, cultures allow us to build those bridges. So let's not poo-poo this and say this is idealistic and, you know, ye pehle hota tha, it's not possible anymore. I think it's still possible. I, want to add, can I, add something? I just want to add that while it was a good step in terms of intent to set up those institutions of culture which Rakshanda referred to in terms of what happened 
during the earlier years after our independence. Let me say to you that many of them were not mediocre, they were shabby. They failed. The Sahitya Academy to which you are referring, referring is a hotbed of sterile politics with very little to show. Now. now I have been a cultural bureaucrat. And I'll tell you one thing. The biggest kiss of death for any cultural institution is the involvement of government. We have the, I'll give you a random example. We hold, the government holds the film, International Film Festival to which hardly anybody of importance comes and it sinks without a trace in a country which produces the largest number of films in the world. Not all of very good quality, but nevertheless. So, a lot of these institutions were backed by the right intent, but gradually became sterile accessories to bureaucracy, which did it in, and we need to reset them up again. All right, um, I think we have space for a couple more. Um, I, uh, Mohit first, then who's at the back? Um, and then the young gentleman in the beard over there. But first, Mohit, um, hi. First row, and then the young, uh, yeah, who we'll just put his hand up. Um, this is not a question, just a comment that uh, even if government institutions may have failed partially to promote and project cultural diversity, I think we are all attending a festival which celebrates that kind of diversity and has brought in Talia, its wake. Please. <laughs> no, I wasn't looking for Talia. And has brought in its wake, as was mentioned a couple of days ago, something like 300 festivals of literature across India. Okay. Um, and then the young gentleman with the beard. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my question is to uh, Mr. Moderator as well, as, and uh, feel free if anyone from the panel to answer. It's on institutional design and uh, looking at modes and measures in terms of building uh, cross-cutting cleavages and, and building a consociational politics when societies are deeply plural and also fractured. So why didn't we, when we do uh, have this nostalgia about the Nehru vision and so on, I mean, in terms of design, why didn't we institute something like a proportional legislature or a proportional vote? to begin with? Why did we look at our masses and sort of belittle them, their intelligence when it came to literacy and them being able to contribute in terms of building a, a certain kind of democracy? Thank you. From the ground. Um, Abhinav, you've written about separate electorates in your book. Can you tell us, was there even an, at any moment in this discussion at that point, was there a sense that there should be something other than the first past the post system, something other than the Westminster model? So there were some systems that were being debated, especially as a replacement to separate electorates. Mind you, the members of the Constituent Assembly of India were elected... Oh, oh, sorry, separate electorate meant that Muslims would vote for a Muslim candidate, Hindus would vote for a Hindu candidate. That is what we had prior to 1947. That's yeah. right. The electorate was divided on the basis of religion. But you see, along with the abolition of separate electorates, we also abolished reservations for religious minorities on political bodies. As a result of which, if you see, in the first parliament of India, in the first Lok Sabha, Muslims were elected to only about 4 or 5 percent of the seats in the Lok Sabha, which is much less than what their share of the proportion in the population is. So when reservations were done away, many members of the assembly tried to debate and say that, look, should we introduce a system whereby religious minorities are given some sort of proportionate representation on legislative bodies, but these were then dismissed as intellectual abstractions, which is really why we've ended up with the system that we have today. Yes, sir. Uh, I do think that we should have thought, we should think now about proportional representation. But I did want to underline that in the end, the best of institutions and the best of electoral systems does not absolve ordinary people, we the people of India, to intervene where we need to. And I think that in moments like this, civil disobedience, for instance, Mahatma Gandhi had said that if, if you regard what is happening as intolerably unjust, it is not only our right, but our duty to, to disobey. And civil disobedience uh, by ordinary citizens, and I believe even by state governments, is the way that democracy functions in many different ways. 
And the formal institutions are some things that we need to, to mend, uh, it, by all means. But I think in the end, true democracy is what we, we right through between elections, do. And I think moments like this remind us about our duty to disobey if we need to uh, uh, and, and, and fight for what we believe in. Last may words, I just, may I just me? jump in here yeah. and say that I find the idea of separate electorates deeply offensive. Uh, or I find that uh, Muslims should elect Muslims or uh, X should elect X and Y should elect Y uh, go flies uh, 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 against the very idea of democracy. Um, I would much rather say, have somebody stand up and say, I am my brother's keeper. You know, to me, that is the essence of democracy. Thank you. I think this has been an absolutely terrific discussion. Thank you all for being, uh, for being here and listening to this. And thank you all for participating. A big thank you goes to Rakshanda Jalil, Harsh Mande, Pavan K. Varma, Abhinav Chandra Chud, and Mihir Sharma. And that session was brought to you by Rajasthan Patrika, the Leadership Series. If you uh, would like to have any books signed by the authors, you can pick those up at the JCB Prize for Literature Bookshop, and you'll find the authors at the Z kiosk in the far right corner of the Nexa Front Lawn for signing. Don't go away, we're going straight into another session here at the Nexa Front Lawn. We'll do an extremely quick turnaround. We're hosting a book launch next for the beautifully Indian Hindu mind by Harsha V. Deheja and he will appear in conversation for the launch with Makarand R. Paranjapi. That uh, book launch will, will proceed in just a moment or two. I'll take this moment also while we do the changeover to remind you about the Jaipur music stage, which happens at Hotel Clark's Amir uh, on several evenings of the festival, including tonight. There is music and dance from seven o'clock and uh, tickets are 500 rupees. You can buy them at the Circular Fountain near the entrance to Digi Palace or at Hotel Clark's Amir this evening. Please do come and join us for some wonderful world music. 